All right, confession with our church family today. Raise your hand if you enjoy singing to yourself or by yourself. How many people enjoy singing to themselves or by themselves? Good. You can put your hands down. In our house, we do too. Our kids love to sing. Our family loves to sing. And it pretty, happens pretty much everywhere. Uh, we have an unintended dirt pile right by our foundation. I know I'm going to get in trouble someday and have to do foundation repair, but our daughters love to dig in the dirt. And they're always singing when they're in the dirt. Usually it's my second born, Eden, who just turned two. And what song does she love more than all of the others? Happy birthday. She doesn't have to sing it to anybody. She's just sitting there, do, 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 do. You know, she's just having fun by herself. Uh, we go on a lot of walks. That was one unintended blessing of COVID is we just did a lot of family walks. And it's not uncommon for us to sing on our walks. And since I have three daughters, you know what we sing? Let it go, let it go, or into the unknown. That's all the singing you're going to get from me today. A lot, lot of Disney. <laughs> you got Mike. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to preaching, not the singing part. Uh, when we're in the car, we're always singing, whether it's songs from Sunday school or nursery rhymes. We just enjoy singing. And it's not just the where, but it's the when. When do you enjoy singing? I don't know about you, but when the weather is balmy and nice, not oppressively hot like it was this past week, I'll find myself singing to myself while I'm mowing the lawn or doing things outside. During holidays, we sing. Almost every holiday comes with music. And when our team wins, which for me as a Vikings and Hawkeye fan isn't as frequently as I would like, we sing. Almost every college sports team has a song you win after a big victory. We typically sing during fun, happy occasions. Last week, we began studying Psalm 119, the longest psalm, the longest chapter, and the longest song in Scripture. And we might be tempted to think that the psalmist wrote this amazing song during one of those mountaintop experiences. Maybe he just spent deep, intimate time with the Lord in the temple. Maybe he spent time gathered around God's people, experiencing joy or feasting. But what the third and fourth section that begin with the Hebrew letters Gimel and Dalet, what they, these sections show us is almost as if the camera zooms out and we see the psalmist singing during suffering, during despair. We see a person at the end of his rope clinging to God and his word. We see someone who's lifting his eyes above his circumstances and fighting for delight. Our big idea this morning is this. Even during desperate times, we must fight to delight in God's word for true hope and freedom. Even during desperate times, we must fight to delight in God's word for true hope and freedom. And if you've ever felt desperate, like you're at the end of your rope, we understand that that desperation can come from the outside and what's done to us and come from the inside. Well, the singer, as he begins the third section, talks about desperation from the outside. Look at Psalm 119, starting in verse 17. We see a desperate prayer. Have you ever prayed those desperate prayers? It's not the flowery King James language prayer. This is desperate. God, my son or my daughter just got in a car accident. God, would you please help them? God, please keep them safe. Or God, they're passing out pink slips left and right at work, and I don't know if I'm going to have a job at the end of the day. God, please help me. Or God, the son or the daughter that I have spent so much time investing in spiritually. I brought them to church. I've read the scriptures with them. God, they're out on their own now, and I don't know if they're going to follow you. God, would you please save them? We have a desperate prayer. And that desperate prayer is summed up in the phrase, Lord, 
Help us understand. He begins with the, the request that God would deal generously with his servant. Look at what it says. God, deal generously with your servant so that I might live. Now we hear the phrase, the word servant, and we think, oh, that's kind of low or depressing. But for the psalmist, that was actually a source of encouragement. Because he was desperate, because he was experiencing affliction, he needed encouragement. And he was reminded, I am a servant of the Most High God. My life is being offered up in worship to God. He says, deal generously with your servant so that I might live. Then I will keep your word. And then in 18, he says, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. God, open my eyes. God, I need to see the truth in your word. Is that it was as if the psalmist was saying, God, I'm trying to navigate life. I'm trying to follow you with no guidance, no direction. God, open my eyes. I'm going through this thing blindly. Yesterday, I ran to Menards, along with most everybody else, it seemed like, on the south side. Did anybody go to Menards yesterday? Any, you did too? Yeah. Were you at the south side one? West Des Moines? Grimes. Oh, that... That's a nice Menards. That's really nice. So I went to Menards yesterday, and I had to buy six fluorescent tube light bulbs for our basement. It was the first time I'd had to do that in three and a half years of owning our house. I had to replace six of them. We were down to one working light bulb. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Jared, why did you let it get that bad? I don't know. I just push off home projects, even the simple ones. That's just kind of what I do. It's not good. But we were at to a point where we could not navigate our basement anymore. It was so dark. We were constantly running into things or we couldn't find things we were looking for. I really wanted to wear this shirt to preach in because it was short-sleeved and breathable, and I couldn't find it for a long time. Changed the light bulbs, all of a sudden, found the shirt. It's amazing. But I needed to have my eyes opened up, so I had to bring light to our situation in the basement. When we go to read God's word, brothers and sisters, it's not just an academic activity. If it was as simple as just putting the words in front of our face, reading comprehension would be the biggest measure of Christian maturity, but it's not. We need the illuminating work of God's spirit, taking God's word and showing us what it means and how we can obey it in our lives. We need the illuminating work of the Spirit. And remember, who wrote this psalm? Someone who is deeply, deeply understanding and walking in God's Word. And if the psalmist, the one who references God's Word so many times in the 176 verses, who pens this amazing song talking about the sufficiency and beauty of Scripture... If the psalmist had to pray and say, God, help me understand, so do we. How do you begin your time in God's word each day? If you don't do this, this is something I've pulled out of the lesson this week, is I need to stop before I read God's word and pray the simple prayer. God, help me understand what I'm about to read. God, I need your word today. And you know what? God answers that prayer. It says, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. And we see another glimpse as we go on in verse 19 of how desperate the psalmist's situation was. He says in verse 19, I am a resident alien on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. Now you hear the word alien, you don't think of E.T. phoning home with some Reese's Pieces. A resident alien is a term for somebody who lives here, but doesn't belong here. The psalmist said, God, I live here, but I don't belong here. I don't, I don't know about you, but the more I live this life, the less this country, this earth, feels like home. How do we live as resident aliens, as people whose citizenship is in heaven, how do we live here on earth? How do we have guidance on how to walk our kids through 
all the changes in our culture, all the deviation from God's word. We need God's help. We need the work of the Spirit in our lives. And the psalmist realized, as a resident alien, that the world he was living in is increasingly hostile towards the things of God. That's why he says, verse 20, I am continually overcome with longing for your judgments. I desire it so much. God, it's like my insides are being eaten up with desire. Have you ever desired something that much? All right, I need the kids in here to stand up. If you are in fifth grade or below, I want you to stand up right where you're seating. Stand up. I want you guys to go VBS mode on me a little bit. You guys were loud during VBS, especially when they were going to do an ice cream sundae on my head. You guys were loud, okay? So I want to hear from you guys today. When it's super hot outside and you've been playing outside all day, and you're in the car, and you drive by and see a beautiful blue body of water. You're dripping in sweat. It's 100 degrees. What do you want in that moment? What do you want? To go in the pool. To go in the pool. That's right, Oliver. You want to swim, right? We want to swim and feel that relief so much. Okay, good. When you've been helping mom and dad pick up sticks, or mowing the lawn, or pulling the weeds and your tongue's hanging out of your mouth, and you look inside, and mom's made a fresh pitcher of ice-cold lemonade. What do you want in that moment? You want it so bad. What do you want? You want the lemonade. You want a drink, right? That's good. And where are the boys that went to junior boys camp this week? We got a couple of them. When you spent all week playing hard, listening to God's word, sleeping on an uncomfortable mattress, and you stayed up way past your bedtime all week, you get home and you see that beautiful mattress in your pillow, and if you're Cade, your teddy bear. And what do you want in that moment? A nap, right? At least that's what I want when I come home from camp. Good job. You guys can take a seat. Thank you. The psalmist says, just like he desires a dip in the pool on a hot day, just like he desires a glass of lemonade, just like he desires a nap after a long week at camp, he desires God's word. He says, I am continually overcome with longing for your judgments. So why doesn't he just pick up his Bible then and read it? Why, okay, dude, like, you really long for God's word. Just open it up and read it. Again, reading God's word isn't an academic activity. It's a supernatural activity. We bring our sinful desires, our sinful motives, our tainted understanding, we bring that to the reading of Scripture. So we need God to do a supernatural work through his spirit, through his word in our hearts. So the psalmist says, God, please help me. I am continually overcome with longing for your judgments. And we see here that he was surrounded by arrogant people. Look at verse 21. You rebuke the arrogant, the ones under a curse who wander from your commands. That arrogant person is mentioned six times in Psalm 119. An arrogant person is somebody who says, okay, yeah, God's word is nice and all, but I'm going to find all of the solutions to life's issues. I'm going to navigate and make all of my decisions using just what's in here. I've got it, everything inside myself. I don't need God's word. I don't need God's revelation. I can figure it out myself. The smartest person I know is the person I see when I look in the mirror. The Bible calls that sort of person arrogant. And the psalmist, the singer, is surrounded by those arrogant people. And they were making his life more difficult. Look what it says in 22. Take insult and contempt away from me, for I have kept your decrees. The writer isn't being self-righteous here and said, God, I've done everything right. But what he is saying is, God... By following you, by living my life according to your word, 
My life is more difficult. I'm being insulted and shown contempt. Maybe you felt that same way. Have you ever been talking with somebody about what you believe or talking about your faith and they kind of look at you with eyes, eyebrows raised and say, you really believe that? Have you ever been passed, out, passed over for a promotion or lost a friendship or been left out of a group chat or been excluded because of your beliefs? If so, you can find encouragement in God's word. It got worse for the psalmist. He says in verse 23, Though princes sit together speaking against me, your servant will think about your statutes. In the Old Testament, the word prince is used just for a powerful person. Have you ever walked into a conversation or a situation and realized that everybody was talking about you? Don't you feel so betrayed, so exposed, so alone in those moments? That hasn't happened to me very often, but when it has happened, I want to respond in the future the way the psalmist did. What does it say he thought about? See, when I know people are talking about me, what do I do? I start thinking about them and all the things they've done wrong. And I start, you know, mounting my defense against them. Oh, you're really going to call me out for that? Or you think I'm doing that poorly? Well, what about this? And before you know it, I'm consumed with thoughts of other people. I'm consumed with thoughts about defending myself. What does the writer of Psalm 119 say? Your servant will think about your statutes. I want to get to a place where I think about God's word and cling to the objective truth in God's word, not my subjective feelings about other people. And then he says, fight for delight. The reason he's so desperate is we don't belong here. But the delight during desperation is he obeys God's decrees. He says, your decrees are my delight and my counselors. When I don't feel like I can talk to anybody around me because they've betrayed me, when I'm feeling the desperation that comes from oppression on the outside, God, your decrees are my delight and my counselors. We believe here at Soteria. It is a conviction of ours. And as one author puts it, a conviction isn't just a belief we hold, it's a belief that holds us. We have the conviction as a church that God's word provides everything we need to navigate life and to follow Jesus. We believe that God's word is our best counselor. That's why we bring God's word into our kids' classes. That's why we teach expositionally from the youngest of ages. That's why if you come in and receive soul care, receive counseling, which is one of my professors called it discipleship in the details, we counsel you with an open Bible because we believe that God has revealed himself in his word and gives you what you need to walk through life no matter how desperate you are by faith. Your decrees are my delight and my counselors. As we talk about desperation as we talk about suffering we realize that quickly suffering from the outside desperation from the outside can bring desperation on the inside and that's where the psalmist moves in the next section desperation inside look at verse 25 my life is down in the dust give me life through your word He's saying this, God, it's as if my soul is ready to return to the dust from which it came. God, my soul is eating dirt right now. God, I feel like I have one foot in the grave. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt so desperate that it's as if your soul was clinging to the dirt? I don't know what you've gone through today. I don't know what type of feelings Father's Day brings you. I don't know what you're walking through right now. But God's word speaks to you if your soul is clinging to the dust. The psalmist says, my life is down in the dust. Give me life. And then what's the, the phrase there? Through your word. 
even though his soul is desperate to the point of death, the singer says, God, give me your word. He sees true hope during those desperate situations to be found in God's word. He says, I told you about my life, verse 26, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Isn't it so comforting to know that we can just dump everything before God? All that we're thinking, all that we're experiencing, all that we're going through. And he hears us. He answers us. Teach me your statutes. And then again in verse 27, we have that appeal for understanding. It says, help me understand the meaning of your precepts. As one preacher I was listening to this week on Psalm 119 mentioned, he says, the Bible is the only book that as I read it, it reads me. It's as if my Bible was following me around and knew what I was going through. That's what God's word does. Help me understand the meaning of your precepts so I can meditate on your wonders. We understand what God's word's teaching us. We understand who God is and we understand who we are when we submit to God's word. But lest we think we just read a verse and keep going and life's peachy keen, the psalmist says in verse 28, I am weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. I am weary from grief. You might be grieving today. You might be grieving because Father's Day doesn't strike up fond memories of your childhood. That relationship might not look the way you wish it would. You might be grieving today because this is the first Father's Day without dad or grandpa or an uncle today. If you're grieving, God's word has hope for you. He says, strengthen me through your word. What is the means to which we get life when we're desperate? When we are weak and grieving, how do we get strength? It's not through outside influences. It's not through positive self-talk. It's through God's word. And the psalmist captures something in verse 29 that is so true of our emotions in our experiences. He wisely asks God, keep me from the way of deceit and graciously give me your instruction. It's in those desperate times that we are particularly prone towards deception, towards self-deceit. We deceive ourselves into thinking during suffering the worst about everybody else. We immediately just assume everyone is against us. We deceive ourselves into thinking that no one's listening no one could possibly know what I'm go- I've gone through. We deceive ourselves into thinking it'll never get better. This will be my lot in life for the rest of my days. And we'll deceive ourselves into thinking I have nothing I can learn through this situation. The psalmist says, God, keep me from those deceptive thoughts. Help me not to go there in my thinking. Help me not to go there in my emotions. Lord, help me to stay grounded in your word. Then he says, graciously give me your instruction. Instead of just asking for relief from his desperation, what does the psalmist ask for? Grace. And we know from our good Father who gives good gifts that if we ask for grace, he will always give it to us. You see, grace does not remove pressure from us. Grace keeps us going straight under pressure. That's what God's word offers. True hope during desperate times. It also offers true freedom. True freedom. The psalmist concludes this fourth section with several I statements that provide so much hope, so much freedom. First, in verse 30, he says, I have chosen the way of truth. God, with all the contempt, with all the insults, with all the conspiring against me, I have chosen the truth. God, I'm not going to follow the advice that just satisfies my sinful desires. Instead, I have chosen truth. In a world of lies and deceit and false messiahs, false saviors, I choose truth. I have set your ordinances before me. 
He says, I choose and then I cling. Look at verse 31. I cling to your decrees. Lord, do not put me to shame. It's as if he has a death grip on the decrees, on the truth revealed in Scripture. We've been doing a lot of swimming this summer with my family, and it's a lot of fun. We, we equip our daughters with floaties and life vests and all that good stuff, but without fail, it seems like every time we swim, if I'm holding one of them, they don't trust their life vest or their floaties, and what do they do? They cling to me, and they will reach for every available piece of flesh or skin. And I learned in those moments, we need to cut our daughter's fingernails more often than we should. Like, man, alive, they got this death grip on me. It hurts. But in that moment, they are clinging to their daddy because they're afraid or they don't feel comfortable. They cling to me. And most of the time it works out just fine for them. In the same way, my daughters cling to me in the pool for security and safety. The psalmist says he clings to God's decrees. He clings to God's decrees. What decrees of God could you cling to today? What about the decree that God will never leave us nor forsake us? What about the decree that says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus? We can cling to the decree that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We can cling to the promise that if we confess our sin, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can cling to God's decrees. And finally, he says, I run. I pursue the way of your commands, for you broaden my understanding. That language, I pursue the way of your commands, is the idea of running free. Man, isn't that a beautiful illustration of the Christian life? Earlier in the stanza, he says, my soul is down in the dirt, clinging to the dust. But God, even in the midst of that, instead of my soul clinging to the dust, I am going to cling to your decrees and I am going to stand up and I am going to run. One of Satan's biggest lies he wants us to believe is that if we live our lives in accordance with God's word, it will lead to bondage and drudgery. And we will just waste away our days until we go to heaven. But true freedom, life-giving freedom, hope, comes in trusting the sufficiency of God's word. And we say, I am going to run down the clear path of your decrees. Even when my soul is clean to the dirt, I am going to run. I am going to pursue the way of your commands, for you broaden my understanding. See, the psalmist captures real and timeless human emotion in these verses. At times, different times to different degrees and different circumstances, all of us will feel moments of desperation. So what connects the desperation we feel from the outside and the desperation we feel on the inside? They don't have two different solutions. They have one solution. And I want to take your gaze back to Scripture. Look at two verses. Look at 18. He says, Open my eyes. Why? So that I might contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. He says, God, open my eyes so that I can see the wondrous things you've done for me, done for Israel in the past. And then he prays again in verse 27, help me understand the meaning of your precepts. Why? So that I can meditate on your wonders. When we fix our gaze on the wondrous works of God as revealed in the word of God, We have hope and freedom for the future. That no matter how desperate our lives seem, we can trust in Jesus. We need God's word to see the wondrous works that God has done. When we open our Bibles, we see that God has wondrously created everything with purpose. We see that God has wondrously orchestrated all of history to accomplish his purposes and no one millisecond of our suffering 
is wasted by our sovereign God. We see wondrously that God chose to send his son, fully human, fully God, to save people who could never save themselves. We see how God can wondrously execute perfect justice in punishing sin while executing perfect love in punishing his own son in place of the people who deserved his punishment. We see in Scripture the wondrous works that God peels the scales off our eyes, plucks us out of our bondage and our slavery to sin, and clothes us in Jesus' righteousness and puts us in his family. And we see the wondrous work that God didn't just save us and says, all right, you guys can figure it out from here, right? You guys got it? All right, go live the Christian life in your own strength. But instead, he's wondrously preserved his word to guide our steps and to live this Christian life by faith. We have a God who does amazing, wondrous things. And that's the hope we can cling to during desperate times. I am thankful to have been able to study this passage this week leading up to Father's Day. This passage hit especially close to home to me because of the relationship I have with my dad. This is my dad. His name's Brian. He has lived with my mom in Waterloo for all of their married life. He's been a member of the same church for like 45 years. He is a fairly unassuming dude. He's an accountant. My dad, though, loves Jesus, loves his family, and loves God's word. My dad has experienced desperation from the outside. He's experienced insult and contempt from coworkers, which cost him his job. He felt that outside pressure from other people. And it caused a, a season of desperation. My dad's also felt desperation on the inside. The words anxiety and depression were common language in our household growing up. My dad has had to walk through valley, desert seasons of life. But what I got to see modeled through my father was fighting to delight in God's word. Because during those desperate seasons, during that period of desperation, all throughout scripture, my dad clung to God's word. I can't tell you how many times I got up during elementary, middle school, and high school, walked out of my room, looked into the living room, and saw my dad sitting in his lazy boy, holding his King James NIV parallel Bible that was about 2,000 pages thick. And he had that Bible open, and he was reading it. He was reading the word. He was praying the word. Day in and day out. He didn't do it to be seen by other people. He didn't post his devotion times on social media. He did it because he was desperate. Desperate for the hope that God's word would only provide. Desperate for the freedom that God's word offered. And I pray as I continue in my fathering and walking with Jesus that I will fight to delight in God's word just like my dad. Just a reminder, our big idea today from Psalm 119, verses 17 through 32, even during desperate times, we must fight to delight in God's word for true hope and freedom. For true hope and freedom. Brothers and sisters, we can cling to the truths of God's word for hope and freedom during desperate times.